see. All right, now, man, I just have no luck. All right, so hopefully um, it hasn't been too long, and the recording, you are hopefully now getting into it. Um, this is Dr. Gagne. It's week six. Uh, I, I guess some of the settings I've had problems with. Um, so please bear with me. I just started talking about the lymphatic system, which is our topic for week six. OK. Oh, I don't. I don't understand the teleconference. OK. So hopefully everybody will be able to listen to this. Just some reminders. Um, you have your midterm coming up October 14th in LH101. If you are one of the people that has special circumstances uh, that needs to um, take the test at a different time, please email me and remind me or set up those special circumstances. Um, if you are um, be aware that we have quiz two coming up and worksheet six is due by Sunday this week. Um, and let's see, I think that's really all the other housekeeping techniques. All right, so welcome. I see I have a student here. Welcome, Christina. So Christina, if you need to stop me or interact with me, if you look above the um, participants, there should be like hands where you can raise your hand or you know tell me yes or tell me no. OK. So just note that you can interact with me if you don't have the ability to talk. And you can also chat with me, um, which I see you figured out. OK. All right, so week six. My big goal in this session is to do a review of the immune system. All right, and the immune system is important because our objective for this week is to talk about um, pathologies and human diseases. And so in order to understand how pathogens work and get into our system, we have to understand how our body tries to prevent pathogens from getting into our system. So the big pathogen categories, we have bacteria, viruses, fungus, parasites, protozoans. We normally spend a lot of time with bacteria and viruses because number-wise, um, there's just a whole larger number of bacteria and viruses that are trying to get in and do us harm. Now, the big difference between bacteria and a virus is a virus is not a cell. And if you go back to uh, your general biology and what is considered life, life is defined as a single-celled organism because it has all the capabilities to reproduce, interact, and meet those characteristics of life. Viruses are not cells. They are usually a grouping of some genetic material and proteins, and their goal is to get into a cell of another organism and take over, hijack that cell. And they do this by part of their proteins, part of their enzyme package is the ability to do some microbiology techniques of reverse transcriptase, so take their RNA and make it into DNA and embed that DNA in, into the organism itself. And they usually have some enzymes that can break bonds in DNA so their DNA can then be inserted. And in doing that, viruses actually help us grow our genetic code. So when we look at the cells of maybe um, humans or humanoid objects from you know, thousands of years ago, uh, their amount of DNA might actually be less than what it is today. And part of that is because um, we've been exposed to so many viruses that maybe have taken up residence. And sometimes when they take up residence, they can stay you know, dormant for years and years and years. Think of like chicken pox virus. You get exposed to it. It gets into your cells. And then nothing happens until maybe you're an old lady and it gets activated and it causes you to have shingles. Right? It's because that virus starts being expressed again because the DNA that the virus is enco uh, encoded uh, starts making more proteins that then inflame and become shingles. Right? Um, bacteria, on the other hand, are cells. So because they're cells, they tend to not necessarily take over cells of your body. They just try to take up residence in your body. So they might try to take up residence in an organ, in a lymph node, some tissue, um, just like other cells in our body do, and uh, feed off of the um, nutrients that are coming from the blood supply and the, the environment that is around them. Okay. 
So our lymphatic system is sometimes grouped together, lymphoid immunity, to, and it encloses all of the white blood cells and all of the tissue that the white blood cells typically live in, so your spleen, your lymph nodes, your tonsils, your thymus gland, and in many cases, this whole system is geared to return fluid back to the cardiovascular system. And as it returns the fluid back to the cardiovascular system, it's going to purify it and ensure that it's clean of any pathogens that might have tried to get into your system. All right, and so our lymphoid system is going to be broadly broken into two big categories. Uh, the nonspecific defenses are going to be all of the cells and the tissues that no matter what pathogen is thrown at it, they respond the same way. They provide a barrier. They provide um, uh, kind of like spitting secretions of uh, acid or base type molecules that will try to kill the pathogen so it can't move further into the body. They will cause inflammation, fever, um, and hopefully death to the pathogen. If the pathogen is somehow able to avoid and get past all of these nonspecific defenses, the second tier of defense is the specific defenses. And this is specifically related to your lymphocyte cells, your T cells, and your B cells. And the goal is that through some of our nonspecific defenses, through some of our interactions with our macrophages, the eosinophils and our neutrophils, our other white blood cells, they eat or ingest and break down pieces or parts of maybe the pathogen trying to come into your body. And they can then expose your T cells, your T helper cells in particular, to this pathogen by presenting broken down pieces of it, which are known as antigens, proteins. And then the lymphocyte can recognize that those pieces and parts of that pathogen are not self. And because they're not self, they then don't belong and generate a, an immune response that is going to specifically target those proteins, those antigens, those pieces and parts of that pathogen, helping us find it faster, quicker, and mount a deadly response to killing it so it doesn't remain in our system. Okay. All right. So the lymphocytes are some of our white blood cells that will stay in circulating blood, and they make up 20 to 30 percent of your circulating white blood cell population, all right? And this is a combination of T cells, B cells, and some other cells known as natural killer cells. Now, each of these cells get their name uh, because of either where they were uh, matured, so where did they finish becoming mature cells, or what they do. So T cells all get their name. They are lymphocytes that are going to mature in the thymus gland. So when our stem cells in our bone marrow get to a certain point in developing towards T lymphocytes, those cells leave the bone marrow, travel to the thymus gland. In the thymus gland, they get exposed to certain thymolytic hormones and molecules that help finish the genetic expression and, and growth and maturation of those cells to where they are functional T cells that can identify whether cells are self or not self. And that is known as immunocompetence, OK? The B cells are going to be cells that um, grow and mature in the bone marrow. That's why they are bone marrow derived cells. And your natural killer cells, so years ago, they would probably be another subtype of T cells. But what we've learned is this is a type of lymphocyte that stays in the bone marrow, but like a cytotoxic or a killer T cell, uh, will actually attack and kill cells that are acting abnormal, so cells that are beginning to express abnormal proteins because they've been overtaken by viruses, or cells that are abnormal and doing things inappropriate because they have been become cancerous, OK? All right, so our T cells, we have a few categories of them. We have cytotoxic T cells. Cyto means cell. Toxic means it's a killer cell, all right? So these are 
T cells, these are lymphocyte T cells that went and left the bone marrow, went to the thymus gland, and became immunocompetent to be able to find and kill any foreign cells or any body cells that are expressing proteins, pieces, and parts of a protein that would not be considered appropriate and self. Right? And they have to attack, so they can, they can kill virus infected cells, and they have to attack by physically touching and then interacting with that infected or inappropriate cell. All right? And when they are activated, they are activated by T helper cells, and they are part of what's known as your cell mediated specific immunity. Okay? Now, your T helper cells. We actually have learned a lot about these cells because these are the cells that your HIV virus targets. And these are the cells that are the link between nonspecific immunity and specific immunity. So these are going to be the cells that turn on cytotoxic T cells. They are going to be the cells that turn on B cells that lead to uh, an antibody um, making, all right? So these are the critical cells in your immune system that allow you to mount specific immune responses. So what is so detrimental about the HIV virus is the virus hijacks and takes over these T cells, so they become virus making protein and RNA and DNA cells, and if they're making virus DNA and virus proteins, they're not then doing their job, and they lead to the complete destruction of all of your specific immune ability because your T cells no longer helper cells work as they're supposed to. They instead just make more virus, more virus, more virus, okay? Your third type of T cells are your suppressor cells, and their goal is to keep the immune response from going overboard and leading potentially to the, um, the cytotoxic T cells or the B cells from beginning to make antibodies and attacking healthy, normal cells. So in our little cartoon here, T cells circulate in the bloodstream, they take up residence in lymph nodes, they live in the spleen, they live in your tonsils, and when exposed to either a cell that's been infected by a virus or they've been ex uh, exposed to like a macrophage or a neutrophil or other white blood cells that ingested a bacteria or a fungus, they then um, are your helper cells and they are going to be able to recognize that your cell is either virus infected and not acting like self, or your cell, your macrophage, your white blood cell has eaten some type of bacteria or fungus that is not self. And in doing that, it recognizes that something is wrong and will start to activate other T cells to mount responses against that virus infected cell. And it can activate killer T cells, which are our cytotoxic T cells, to kill that cell. It'll activate other helper T cells to interact with B cells and trigger immunity through antibodies to be developed against that virus infected cell. Some of these T cells and T helper cells will become memory cells so they can always circulate in our system for a period of time and provide protection against this virus or bacteria or fungus for the longevity of our life. And then some will become suppressor cells that will protect healthy cells from being killed inappropriately by overzealous killer cells and overzealous um, antibodies. Okay? So that's kind of how the T cells work. The B cells work in that they have the genetic um, code, like all of our cells, but their genetic code that they pay attention to are all these special proteins known as antibodies. And there are parts of the antibody that can be altered in these cells that then will match to foreign objects, foreign pieces or parts of viruses, bacteria, fungus, protozoan cells that shouldn't be in our system. But in order for the, the B cell to change the genetic makeup of its DNA to then make proteins specific to a pathogen, it has to be told to do that by T helper cells. 
right? So what you see here is B cells are in circulation, just like T cells. And they are going to be in our um, bone marrow. They are going to be in our spleen. They are going to be in our lymph nodes. They are going to be in our tonsils. They are going to be all over our body. And by interacting either directly with bacteria or interacting with T cells that have been activated by um, T helper cells, activated by macrophages, neutrophils, and, and white blood cells of our nonspecific defenses, the B cell can be triggered to start to upload pieces and parts of that bacteria that it can then make specific antibodies against so we will always be able to find that uh, pathogen whether it comes into our system in five years and ten years and, uh, and our memory cells maintain that kind of code for forever. So let's think about the tuberculosis test. That tuberculosis test is you get a little needle inserted into your skin and they put into your dermis of your skin um, some dead pieces and parts of tuberculosis bacteria. And if you have ever been exposed to tuberculosis bacteria before and have been then had to mount a antibody response against this tuberculosis bacteria, you are going to, within three or four days, have this big red whelp on your arm, all right? And that means that your body, at some point in time, saw tuberculosis bacteria, mounted antibodies specifically against it, and so we are exposing more tuberculosis bacteria into your system, and so you're getting a big red whelp. If you do not get anything on your arm, so you test negative to tuberculosis, that means you've never been exposed to the bacteria, you've never had your B cells clone more antibodies against the bacteria, and so nothing happens because that piece and part of material we stuck in your skin is nothing to you because it isn't a pathological problem, it's just dead debris that your neutrophils and macrophages will eat up and clean up, okay? Now, the NK cells, again, in our old books, the NK cells, the natural killer cells, at one point were probably part of the killer T cell population. But what we learned with better techniques is that these cells actually do not go to the thymus glands. So they're not technically T cells. But like some of our killer cells and our cytotoxic T cells, they have this ability to do what's known as immunological surveillance. They go around and interact with any cell in the body, whether that cell is foreign or self, and try to figure out if the cell is acting how it's supposed to or if it's been hijacked by a virus or if it doesn't belong. And if it doesn't belong or it's not acting appropriate, it then, like killer T cells, will try to kill that cell. All right, so some of the terms of immunity, again, we talked about specific and nonspecific immunity, all right? When we get into um, different ways of looking at our specific and nonspecific immunity, we can talk about whether it is innate or whether it's acquired. And innate immunity, in some ways, is your, some of your nonspecific immunity factors. Your barriers, which are your epithelial lining, your white blood cells that live behind your epithelial lining. These are all things that everybody, if you have the correct genetic makeup and you are normal expressing human being, you are going to have and they are going to be part of your nonspecific immunity and they are innate to you genetically in your body have epithelial tissue, therefore you have barriers against pathogens getting into your system, all right? Now, your other innate barriers or, um, or innate immunity is related to if you have cells, if you have the white blood cells that are made through normal genetic expression of um, hematopoietic bone marrow stem cells, you will then have your neutrophils, your macrophages, your basophils, your eosinophils, your natural killer cells. And all of these cells are part of the white blood cell population that is nonspecific immunity that has the ability to eat, spit, and interact with foreign pathogens behind epithelial um, tissues. These are the cells that are living in your dermis of your skin. These are the cells living behind the respiratory mucus tract 
in your tonsils, in your lymph nodes, and in your um, connective tissue behind your airways. And these are the, the cells that, when presented with foreign objects, mount nonspecific responses that might lead to asthma or allergies, because they're acting inappropriate, or might lead to preventing tuberculosis from ever getting into your bloodstream and taking up residence in your body. Okay. The other part of innate immunity is we make proteins from most of our cells in our body. And some of the proteins we can make are these specific cytokines that have the ability to kill pathogens. And one pathway is known as your complement pathway, which is just a series of proteins that live and reside in your bloodstream. And when they interact with bacteria, in many cases, they punch holes in it, and that causes bacteria to die. Okay. The other side of the immune system is usually related to the specific immune response, meaning because we acquire a pathogen, we are exposed to the pathogen, we mount a specific response that allows us to target that pathogen and kill that pathogen. All right? And so the acquired immune system is usually our specific immune responses. So our T helper cells activating cytotoxic T cells to kill cells that are overtaken by viruses, as well as our helper T cells targeting and turning on B cells to make antibodies that are then able to find foreign viruses, foreign cells, foreign proteins, and um, highlight them to be killed by complement, by cytotoxic T cells, and by macrophages and neutrophils. Okay. So that's kind of sometimes acquired and specific immune responses are used interchangeably. Sometimes innate and nonspecific uh, immunity are used interchangeably. Okay. So this is, again, when we talk about our immune system, we usually divide our body's defenses into what everyone should have because of your um, of, because you fall into this human body and you should have four tissue types and you should have the genetic compounds and genome of a human. And in that genome, you should have white blood cells and you should have uh, certain genetic makeup and proteins that every human being should have. Okay, So if someone doesn't have uh, the right gene because of a mutation or a genetic deficiency, and that leads then for them to not be able to maybe have complement proteins, they are going to then always potentially be, you know, human and alive, but more susceptible to pathogens that complement proteins might kill, all right? This would be, let's say you don't have the protein to make yourself run a fever, OK? So if you don't have the pyrogens that tell the brain to run a fever, run temperature high, you would potentially be more prone to being sick and more prone to pathogens causing more problems in your system because you never can run a fever to temperature-wise turn on your cells, make them move faster, or heat kill um, pathogens in your body, OK? Whereas adaptive or specific defenses, um, this would be problems like the HIV leading to AIDS. Because a virus came in, took out one of your specific helper cells, you now have no ability to mount cytotoxic cell-mediated immunity or make antibodies against pathogens. And so what ends up killing people with HIV and AIDS is pneumonia, the common cold, uh, because Things that they should normally be able to overcome, they can't because the virus killed a key component of specific immune responses or adaptive immune responses, All right? So just to review, what are our types of nonspecific defenses? We have physical barriers. This is epithelial tissue. Any, your skin, your mucous membranes in your nose, your mouth, the lining of your mouth the lining of your airways with mucus that's there. Anything that the lining of your stomach, the lining of your gut, anything that would potentially keep an organism from being able to get into your bloodstream and into your tissues and organs. Right? Behind our physical barriers are white blood cells. Many of those white blood cells are the uh, neutrophils, macrophages, eosinophils, and basophils. And these cells 
can take up residence or be kind of free floating because they can be in the bloodstream and recruited to an area. They are going to respond to foreign objects, both molecules like particulate matter or ragweed or mold to bigger things such as bacteria, fungus, viruses in the air in the that gets on your skin or gets in your mouth or nose. So these cells, when they act inappropriately and overdo their responses, they can lead to allergies and asthma attacks. When they act appropriately, they help prevent us from maybe getting mold in our bloodstream or fungus in our bloodstream or bacteria in our bloodstream. Okay? And they then help trap and capture particles that then can be presented to lymphocytes and lead to specific immune responses. So they play a key role as well as helper cells, T helper cells in getting specific responses activated. All right. Immunological surveillance, this is your natural killer cells. They work and destroy cells that are becoming cancerous, that are no longer following normal cell cycle, normal things, um, cell events and expression of cell proteins. Okay. All right. What's the next one? Uh, other pieces, again, this is just a little cartoon of how natural killer cells work. They work by binding to cells being abnormal, and then through interactions of certain proteins, they punch holes, kill, destroy that cell, and then um, remove it from um, the system. Okay, so they're best working against cells that have been infected by viruses that could become cancerous. They work against cancer cells, and they work against parasite-infected cells. Okay. All right. Interferons and complements are specific little protein messengers that live in your bloodstream that can help coordinate the lymphocytes, the T cells, the cytotoxic T cells, the antibodies, and the B cells, as well as neutrophils, macrophages in your, um, in your body. And they can help kill cells and pathogens that have gotten past the epithelial barriers and some of maybe your white blood cells. Inflammatory responses we know are responses that occur when cuts and tissues are damaged because, and, and maybe um, pathogens are trying to get into the system. And so it's a tissue response to try to minimize exposure to pathogens as well as to prevent pathogens from getting access to the body. So it's normally, you know, um, pus and mucus and fever and swelling that occurs in an area. And then fever is the whole body response to try to accelerate tissue and cells such as lymphocytes and neutrophils and macrophages so that way they are better able to defend against pathogens. Also raising body temperature itself can sometimes kill viruses or bacteria because they can be sensitive to temperature. Okay. And so these are some of the things that happen when we see inflammation. And then this is what happens when we see fever. And again, if you somehow had the gene messed up for pyrogens or interleukins, you might not be able to make a fever. And that would be a problem with your innate um, or nonspecific defenses. And that would be a genetic defect that caused that. Okay. So our summary of innate or nonspecific defenses, any chemical any mechanical, so teeth maybe could be part of this. They could ground up uh, bacteria and viruses in your food. The stomach acid could kill it. Mucus could capture it. And then these are some of our first line defenses. All right. If things get past those first line defenses, we hopefully have white blood cells, fever, inflammatory responses take over. If things get past that, we have to hope that the acquired immunity takes over and mounts a response. And this is where things like smallpox and measles and mumps and flu can kill people before the third line of defense, which can take up to eight to ten days, can kick in. Okay? And if you if that pathogen works and kills you within three to four days, that's why we develop all of these artificial uh, vaccines and processes to try to um, help the body so if you're exposed to something, you can mount a defense more quickly so you don't die by the time your normal acquired defenses come into play. Okay. So again, our specific defenses, we have the T cells 
playing a key role, specifically the T helper cells, and then the T helper cells activate cytotoxic T cells, suppressor cells, and the whole cell-mediated death and response, and then the B cells get activated to make a humoral or a protein response that's antibody-related, okay? So when we look at our specific defenses, we can basically, like I said, have natural immunity that is naturally acquired, naturally happens, but for some pathogens in the world, anthrax and smallpox and Ebola, the, the natural responses might not be fast enough to prevent death from occurring. Um, so the virus or the pathogen can act so quickly that you can't be alive long enough to overcome it. So that is where, through science and through just some wonderful uh, experiments in different um, animal and cell models we've learned and been able to develop passive type uh, and adaptive immunity and artificial immunity that can help us maybe live and not die from horrendous, horrible things, okay? And so immunity, again, your innate immunity is kind of those barriers, things that are genetically determined. The adaptive immunity, we have two ways to acquire. We can acquire it naturally because you naturally get exposed to tuberculosis bacteria, or you naturally get exposed to smallpox or polio, and then you live long enough and your body is quick enough to overcome and, and um, kill that infection and survive it. The other way to naturally acquire immunity would be how mom and fetus interact. Mom, through her antibodies crossing the placenta, can, you know, protect baby from pathogens. And then when baby's born, there is still some passive um, immunity and passing of immunity from mom to baby with breast milk. So this is one of the reasons why um, breast milk is pushed, because it affords the baby mom's specific defense because some of those antibodies end up in baby and can help baby not get as sick as a child that maybe is only getting formula, okay? The other ways we can adapt our bodies is through uh, medical procedures and medical techniques. So we can artificially expose people to non-virulent forms of smallpox, non-virulent forms of polio, non-virulent forms of hepatitis, non-virulent forms of chickenpox through vaccines. And this is where artificially active immunity can occur, meaning we can make someone be exposed to a dead or non-virulent, so non-killing, non-active form of a virus or bacteria, and through that exposure, mount specific defenses, make T cells against that um, pathogen, make B cells and memory cells against that pathogen. So if we are ever then exposed to the real one, we can more quickly overcome and maybe not get sick at all, or if we get sick, have a milder form of the sickness or disease. Now, we know that some viruses and bacteria still are pretty evasive or difficult to mount um, specific responses to. And so the third way we can artificially and passively try to help, and this was done with the Ebola outbreak, um, was we took some survivors who were able to, like the guy, the one doctor who survived the Ebola, and then they took his blood and gave it to one of the nurses that got sick with Ebola, and by introducing his antibodies and his uh, blood to the nurses, she was able then to get antibodies against the Ebola and didn't die. Um, you see this with IV drugs, with artificial antibody uh, pills. You know, there are some things we give antibiotics to to help the system kind of find and mount responses because it might be that our responses are taking too long to gin up or, you know, come into play. Right? So what's cool about this immune system is it gives us some characteristics. Um, it gives us specificity. So we can always find specific defenses against any antigen presented to us. It just means it might take us eight to ten days to get there, or if we've helped through vaccinations or antibiotics, uh, we might be able to get there sooner. Uh, we are versatile. We are ready to convert and confront any antigen at any 
way, shape, or form because we have nonspecific and specific abilities. We have memory. Uh, some of our memory cells might live, you know, a fixed period of time. Think about your tetanus shot. You have to get your tetanus shot about every five to ten years because typically the uh, uh, antibodies in the memory cells against the tetanus um, pathogen uh, are not as effective or they're not high enough to be effective, so we booster ourselves with um, continual exposure against the non-virulent pathogen every five to ten years. But if you get mumps or measles or chicken pox, you usually get that once and you never get it again because of the memory. So there is something to memory and only having to suffer through a pathogen once especially some of the nasty pathogens out there. And then tolerance. As long as our immune system works correctly, we are tolerant in that we don't kill ourselves. We only kill anything that is foreign. We stay immunocompetent. And that goes wrong. And so immuno, uh, like lupus, uh, MS, a lot of the diseases where the immune system starts attacking healthy self cells can lead to problems um, because we're no longer immunocompetent and tolerant. Okay. And again, the T helper cell is the key cell for transitioning from specific to non, uh, non specific to specific defenses. And if you get into immunology, there are some different T helper cells that express different proteins on their membrane. And, uh, and we learned all of this really and truly because of AIDS. Um, when the HIV virus started hitting, they knew nothing really about T helper cells and CD8 and CD4 expression cells, and it's through AIDS and HIV research that we, and so this whole immunology T helper cell is actually a very young study, uh, and we've only learned things with about the system within the last 30 years, so it's constantly changing. All right, and again, your B cells are all about making immune, immune, uh, immunoglobulins, uh, antibodies that circulate and find um, any antigens, small uh, proteins or pieces and parts of bacteria or viruses or pathogens that have tried to take up residence. And we maintain memory cells for our lifetime, hopefully, always against those pathogens, okay? All right, and again, this is just trying to show you that uh, nonspecific defenses uh, are always happening within your first uh, day to week of exposure, so the barriers are in place. If something gets past the barriers, our natural killer cells, our neutrophils, our macrophages, which are all cells part of the innate immune system, are there to try to mount a response. Our specific defenses, if we've never been exposed to a pathogen, those defenses will take somewhere from 7 to 10 to 14 to 21 days. And so that's why if something is really, really deadly, like the Ebola was killing people within 3 to 4 days, cholera kills people within 3 to 4 days. Again, if you have a viral pathogen that can kill you in 3 to 4 days, you will die before your specific defenses can ramp up and overcome. And so that's why the, uh, the vaccine and the, the ability of us to manipulate our bodies to overcome exposures to non-virulence prior to virulent exposure is so helpful and has allowed us to eradicate certain viruses from killing people in our, in our world, in our country, okay? And again, this is just showing you if things take uh, from the first exposure a normal acquired immune response, you will take 7 to 10 days to mount a, a good response versus if you had a vaccine or if you ever get exposed to that virus or bacteria a second time, your memory cells being in place, your antibodies being in place, let you start to mount a pretty potent response in 2 to 3 days instead of um, 7 to 10 days. Okay, hopefully this helped explain a lot of the immune system, helped review a lot of the immune system. It is 11 o'clock, so I went over. Hopefully you were able to make it through the first five, six minutes of silence and get to the lecture part. If you have questions, use the forum. Otherwise, I'll see you guys next week, and I'll see you on the 14th for sure uh, for our midterm exam.